um, on behalf of the University of London <coughs> Institute in Paris and Queen Mary University of London. Really, really happy to welcome you all here this evening for what I'm sure is going to be a very, very stimulating evening. Um, we're very, very lucky to have the speakers and panelists we do. I'm not going to introduce them yet. I am going to introduce a special friend of uh, the University of London Institute here. Um, Simon Gaskell is the principal and president of Queen Mary University of London, and uh, he's agreed to join us here today to witness this inaugural lecture in the Challenging Europe series. Um, Simon's background is as a scientist in mass spectrometry, spectrometry get this pronunciation right, um, for biomedical applications. And uh, he practiced as a, a professor of, of uh, mass spectrometry in the UK and in the USA for many years, uh, before moving on to leadership roles, notably in research. Uh, he was a vice principal for research at the University of Manchester soon after um, the two parts of the University of Manchester came, to, came together. And then he became principal of Queen Mary in 2009. And um, Simon has always seen a very successful uh, period of growth and development at Queen Mary University of London. And uh, I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit more about that. But moving into the top 100 global institutions and moving up the research rankings very substantially are all fantastic achievements. So we're, of course, very proud of our association with Queen Mary. And now over to Simon, just to say a few words of greeting. Thank you very much, Tim. It's always um, helpful when someone else does your boasting for you. So I won't, um, <clears throat> I won't bore you with further details. We are, of course, very proud of what we've achieved at Queen Mary. But really what we're celebrating this evening uh, is this joint enterprise with, with ULIP here in, in Paris, and I'm delighted to be able to be here for this uh, inaugural lecture and reflect for maybe just a few moments um, about the partnership rather than about uh, uh, Queen Mary. Uh, ULIP, of course, has been here many years and has much uh, to be proud of in, in its history, uh, but I think we are and have been uh, moving into a new chapter over the last couple of years. Um, both in terms of the success of ULIP and in terms of the um, importance and success of the relationship with Queen Mary University of London, which is now very, very close and, and very productive um, in, in all respects, academic uh, and, and uh, in, in, as a collegial um, grouping between two, two partner institutions. We have, of course, always been partners on the languages and the history side. Uh, we have a very strong program, LLM program, here in Paris now, which we're extremely proud of and is really flourishing. And as we move into this um, further activity in international relations, that seems both logical um, for both of us and, and I'm sure will be highly productive. So technically, um, Queen Mary, of course, is co-hosting this evening. That's, a, that's a, in a formal sense. Your physical hosts are obviously ULIP. Um, but uh, in a sense, we, we don't see the, uh, the distinction between those two institutions. Very much partners um, behind this event, and, and therefore, on behalf of that partnership, as much as uh, on behalf of Queen Mary, may I add my welcome to you uh, to this event. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy the evening, as I'm sure I will. Take. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. And uh, as you do for these events, of course, you, you knock on your neighbor's door and ask if they can help you out, uh, which we did. And we asked uh, the president of the American University of Paris, uh, a very good neighbor to us, uh, to come here and uh, chair this event. So I'll now introduce um, Celeste Schenk, who is the president of AUP and indeed our neighbor here. Uh, we do a lot of work together. Uh, and could, we'll do so in the next few years as well. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Celeste, in her 25 years at AUP, has completely transformed the university in many, many different ways, pedagogical, uh, infrastructure, premises, approach, programs, uh, across the whole spectrum. Um, Celeste is president of the university and also president of the Association of American um, international colleges and universities, and her academic background is a, a, liter a literary background. She uh, specializes in women's poetry and autobiography, as well as critical theory and approaches to pedagogical issues. Celeste is going to chair the evening and do any other introductions and 
manipulations that are necessary. So now over to Celeste. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't planning on doing any manipulation, so don't, don't be expecting that. Um, well, it is a great pleasure tonight to be asked by Tim Gore to moderate this inaugural lecture and, and the panel, the respondents that will follow. Um, there's probably few issues of more interest, I think, to citizens and residents of Europe right now than some of the critical issues that are going to come up tonight. Obviously, the refugee crisis, terrorist events, and the interplay amongst these events, and so and, um, amongst these forces. So that's one of the things you'll hear about in the first lecture. And uh, Jeff Riesmans, whose name I really wanted to pronounce right, because we pronounce that Riesman here in France, Riesmans, who is a professor of international politics in the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. He's co-editor-in-chief of the journal International Political Sociology. He's best known, actually, for his work on the politics of insecurity, the securitization of migration, and critical methods. Currently, he's working on security and democracy in times of surveillance, the political life of methods, and the political significance of everyday practices. And I'll just read the names of a few of his books, Security Unbound, Enacting Democratic Limits, The Politics of Insecurity, Fear, Migration, and Asylum in the EU, what is Politics, The Politics of Protection, Sites of Insecurity and Political Agency, and then a number of books with other people, Community, Citizenship and the War on Terror, Security and Insecurity, and, the Const uh, and Citizenship and Security, the Constitution of Political Being. So I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Husman, who will give the inaugural lecture. The lecture itself is called The Politics of Insecurity, Challenges for Europe. And the lecture will be followed, as I said, by two respondents, and I'll introduce each of them at the end of Jeff's talk. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's also my first time at Europe. And I've been in Paris, of course, many times, but I've never been here. Can you hear me in the back, or do I need to speak up? Is it okay? Yeah, okay. Because I'm suffering from a cold, so if I start shouting now, I'm not going to make it for 40 minutes. Uh, <coughs> okay. So it's been a great pleasure to open the seminar series on challenging Europe. Now, one of the issues is, when I was asked to do this, is we'd like you to talk about security and insecurity and your work around this. But nowadays, you know, when you people say talk about security and security, it's not very clear what actually one should talk about because there is so much talk around safety, anxieties, fear, securities, insecurities. I could easily, I don't know what you expect. I mean, I wrote a little blurb, so actually it wouldn't be. But I could easily be standing here talking about global health issues. I could stand here talking about, you know, migration as I will do. I could be here talking about global environmental politics. I could talk about counterinsurgency. I could talk about a million things, not a million, but there's quite, I mean, if you look at, for example, in the discipline itself, but also in the more vernacular media, if you want, I mean, there is a lot of issues that somehow some people can cover with security. So I was sitting there and I thought what to talk about, and it was in November, so I thought maybe I can reflect a bit on the fact that two issues came together at some point, which is that one was talking again about the refugee crisis, uh, but basically a high, an extremely sensitive and also quite radical politicization of refugees coming into Europe, which is not new. I mean, but it actually took on particular dimensions. Uh, which had been going on over the summer and a bit before, at least when it came to highly visible in the newspapers. And at the same, a bit, we also had uh, the tragic terrorist attacks in Paris here. And something happened, which of course for me as someone who has been looking at migration and security is somehow not surprising, but it is still a bit unsettling, is that within almost a day, the two are connected, right? You got statements, where the French Prime Minister actually feels yes, he says something that, you know, the tax affirmé jeudi que des auteurs des attaques du 13 novembre à Paris ont profité de la crise des réfugiés pour se glisser en France. So it has a connection. 
For so long, the president actually reacts immediately, saying, no, we should not do that. You got a reaction from uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, I don't know, the, the president of the commission, I don't know whether you can read that one, where he starts saying, I try to make it crystal clear that we should not mix the different categories of people coming to Europe, say, keep them separate. In an interview with the Czech television station, uh, the Syrian president, al-Assad, uh, also actually says, yes, there is a connection. You know, they're using the refugee guys. So there are all kinds of politics going on. You can find, if you just go, do you find them immediately these connections that are being made? And then you got people saying, well, you know, we shouldn't make these connections and so on. And in a way, I find it's always unsettling if these things are combined. But the, the interesting thing is, it's not surprising they were connected. And specifically not in the context of uh, Europe and the European Union for one, and the national states as well. There has been going on for a long time now a process in which one actually started knitting together or connecting and institutionalizing a connection between border controls, migration, refugees, and security issues, specifically terrorism and organized crime. And that goes back, for example, in the context of the European Union, it goes back to the, the, the construction of the Schengen agreements, and so on. And much more is going on in these, but they are a basis which led, which led to something what we now, some of us, call an internal security field, which is, of course, the third pillar, later on the area for <coughs> freedom, security, and justice, that was actually formulated. So there's an institute where these things coexist. And there is a lot, I mean, for example, in a recent report that uh, I think some people here were actually involved in, that was published by SEPS on the reaction in SF written as, you know, what is the EU doing now in response to the Paris attacks? It's actually said this quote is in there as well, and then it immediately says, but at the same time that Jean-Claude Juncker says this, at the same time, all the policy measures that are introduced and that all the intentions have to do with reinforcing border controls and basically mobilizing security institutions, agencies, to actually do that patrolling. So there is an institutionalization of these elements that come together. And they have not necessarily only to do with terrorism, they have to do with various issues that it's set up. So in some way, it is not at all surprising. Neither is it surprising if you follow the political discourses that have been going on. There seems to be quite a lot of political capital nowadays <coughs> to articulate anxieties and insecurities that are related, that one relates to migration, wider issues of mobility, and terrorism. And so there is talk, I mean, you know that talk. It ranges from people speaking about swarms of refugees coming in, you know, these connections that are made here, and so on. So there is, seems to be political capital in making these connections as well. <coughs> and in that sense, you can say, all right, so these, you might find it unsettling, but it's not surprising. But that doesn't make it less an issue of concern. I would think. And uh, <coughs> there are different takes on this. And so what I would want to do is to run through an argument that something is going on about that makes this particularly unsettling for doing this. This is not the only reason why it's unsettling. You know, part of that, there's a strong argument which is very much always in the news and which is being discussed all the time, which is how these connections ultimately and the way one actually deals with refugees, how mobility of people is becoming politicized, is undermining and or at least challenging seriously some of the global normative international legal networks around the rights of people and so on. So that's one of the reasons why it's unsettling. Transgressive policies are possible. One sees a lot of detention centers, one accepts a lot of people dying and so on on the back of this. So in that sense you can see there's an unsettling. What I will try to do it's a bit more an abstract element to bring in. That I think there is also another reason why this is quite unsettling and try to understand. So that how comes that these two things are together? And what I would like to <coughs> develop in the next well, about 25 minutes is that it brings this connection, it brings into focus something that one would call as an institutionalization and a normative embedding of violent political dispositions and the organization of politics around the fact 
and prospects of violence. So this connection that is being made is not just about rights regimes and so on. It also has to do with how politics becomes organized around prospects, uses by various actors of violence, where also the legitimate boundaries to violence are actually pushed. And so politic violence becomes an issue. If it is political capital, which you can mobilize to, to articulate certain kinds of interests and so on. And that's, I use the term, it's a bit, I don't know whether I'll stick with it, but I thought I'll try it out today. It's the term violent democracy. It's not necessarily that democracies are violent, they are violent, but it's where violence becomes a kind of organizing device which is central to the politics that's happening in democracy. The prospects, uses of violence. And this is not, of course, just the violence of what one refers to as terrorist organizations. It also has to do with the militarization of border controls. It has to do with how Europe operates and European states operate in the global framework. It has to do with how you can have, as Anastasia Tsukala, who we are here in a bit, in, in November road, <laughs> raised the question about how comes that when we have that certain issues that we know around, you know, problems in cities, urban degradations, and so on, always we seem to require more and more that violent acts have to happen, or violent, language about violence has to come in, for it to be central to the political scene. That's what I mean with violent democracy. Is that violence becomes an issue around which political positioning, political discourses, and issues. But it also has an institutional dimension, which you can see uh, in, for example, uh, the increasing militarization of border controls, for example. And so I think this is unsettling that that happens. What I want to do in the remainder is try to show that violent democracy, the conditions for violent democracy, Yes. Conditions for that. Oh, this is too low. I should have moved that. The conditions for <coughs> violent democracy go hand in hand with something else. So, what we've done now is actually said, I'll try to see how we should not forget. This is about rights and the transgression of rights and this element, but the specific connection between refugees and terrorism also is an element, a terrain, in which violence becomes an area of politics both as a political instrument, as a political discourse, as a concern, which organizes how one does politics. <coughs> and how this transformation is embedded in, or how this condition is embedded in particular transformations in society that are happening. And I'll rely a bit on uh, <coughs> cultural anthropologist Apadurai and a historical sociologist, Michael Mann, to actually do that. So what I want to do now is to say that partly the terrain that's becoming visible, sharply visible, but is also an act of <coughs> these connections that are being made, which I just showed, and by the denial of them, is a combination of three, four processes. One is the displacing of conflict over social stratifications with conflict between identities, whether they're cultural, religious, or racial, but there, which is an internal process that happens within demo democratic states and democracies. So it's not actually outside of democracy. This hangs together with the culturalizing of politics, so these two go, up, go together. And a politics of the fear of small numbers, which is Apadurai's uh, take, which is much more about global element, but I'll place it into Europe and the crisis. And if I have time, I'll also, but I might run out of time by then, talk a bit about how this hangs, the politics of fear of small numbers hangs together with how there is ever a more governmental talk around anxieties, insecurities, and so on, and what that does to the constitution of society and community as society and communities of insecurity, and how these conditions are actually quite prone to violence as an element, as a concern, as an instrument, etc. Good. Let's see what we get. <coughs> so, so let's start. Uh, let's start from the. Oh, All right, I'll speak closer to the mic. Although that's a bit loud, I think. Is that much better in the back? All oh, right, then. Maybe I should shout, but not with the mic so close. Uh, democracy. 
if democracy is a form of politics which basically locates legitimacy in the people under the form of rule by and for the people, which also combines, therefore, a desire or a problem about who are the people, and the people have to come together as an expression of, you know, we have all kinds of diverse interests and so on. Who are these people? How can we aggregate our differences into something that we can then act around, which we can not necessarily come together, but issues that are beyond the very small entities and interests that are there. <coughs> And if democracy, the defining element of democracy, is not about electoralism and not necessarily about reaching consensus, but about how you, the kind of conflicts that one then articulates as conflicts that are defining for the wider society. And there are, and that's what democracy is about. It's a way of actually dealing with the articulation of conflictual elements. I mean, I'll come back, there are many examples of this. One of the traditional ones, of course, between employers and unions, labors and union you know, elements. So there are different elements. But you can also have other kinds of interests that are there. And how there are conflicting elements, we find this in society all the time, how they are actually dealt with. So democracy is really about not managing conflict, but articulating conflicts in particular ways. Now, Michael Mann, in a book called The Dark Side of Democracy, uh, which really dealt with, it was written in 1999, I believe, which really dealt with ethnic cleansing and genocide at that time. But what he actually did was that within these democracies, there are two big modes in which how conflicts are being dealt with. And the first is where you actually have conflicts over stratification, he says. It's the hierarchical division of societies on the basis of social characteristics, such as wealth and status where actually wealth and status in a society where there is a distribution of unequal, where there are unequal rewards, where the people are not in divisible unity, but a constellation of different classes or different strata in. And uh, that conflicts between them are over which strata matter politically and the hierarchy between different groups. Now, these interesting claims can be organized through social movements, civil societies, party representation, elections, professional organization, and classes. But it creates a form of social relations around conflicting interests and rights. And what's important is that the strata cannot, are in this kind of conflict not segregated. They are not two units that are not related to one another. They are interdependent. And for example, one cannot have flashy finance offices and no cleaners. The two are actually connected fundamentally in actually making that system work. Right? So there are elements where there is a recognition that there is an interdependence, which changes the conflict in the sense that the conflict constitutes a shared entity field in which various actors have somehow a legitimate presence because they are part of the society or of that particular building or whatever it is within which there are conflicts. And so there is an interdependency, not segregation, Right? There's a hooking together, and you negotiate bargain. Sometimes, of course, this can be pretty radical, too, how the bargaining goes and the negotiating. But it actually is a, there's always an underlying recognition that they are part of the same element. Of course, you also have struggles around social stratification about people claiming the right to have rights. Mobilizations about those who come in, not from outside necessarily, but onto the political scene as having rights which are not actually provided or given, but they will actually try to <coughs> enter by making claims that they are part of a societal element. I'll give you an example of this. It's when... <coughs> so the traditional example, sorry, is always in this kind of understanding, the employers and the unions in a kind of corporate corporate this kind of connection where they negotiate and bargain, right? And they're both legitimate partners, although they have serious conflicts of interests between them very often. So that's it. But there are others in Europe, for example, you can see, I mean, there is the famous on the migration side, the sans papier, trying to mobilize and claim. Now, what they're claiming is a right to have rights, partly. So to be part of the scene. Now, that is actually an element which, act, which is part of the recognition and the basis that we're here human, we are part of a recognized international, national rights regime, we're there, but we are also here. The same happened, for example, another example, when sex workers 
try to mobilize in 2005, but on other occasions as well, to claim certain rights, human rights as well as other rights that were not covered by the usual human rights conventions. <laughs> they come together, and what do they say? We are citizens of Europe. Not all of them formally are citizens of Europe, but they claim the right to have rights, which is basically an argument. We are here as workers, for example. So we are part of the societies. We have a dependency, interdependency in there. And so the struggles are of that. And then, of course, you can have struggles over social stratification, which is not only rights, but is also certain social rights you can get. It's, it's not just human rights, although human rights now is a very big term that covers a whole lot. But I hope you can see there is a particular form of conflict what Mao says there is within democracies. You could call this social democracy because it's how the social is constituted historically as a terrain of politics. But of course, social democracy has also party political connotations, so it's a bit of an open term <coughs> to use. But I hope you see what I mean. He contrasts that with <coughs> another form of democratic conflict, where democratic conflict starts doing the we, the people, not in terms of interdependencies and stratification, but in terms of cultural, religious, ethnic identities. They become communities yeah, which actually identify themselves partly through cultural heritage, religious beliefs, and so on, but they become identitarian. And what that means is you actually distinguish yourself very much from other communities, either inside or from the outside. <coughs> And so the unity among the people becomes identified around what he calls inorganic cultural, but I think we can broaden that around racial, but specifically also religious at the moment, communities that are brought together. So what is important is that how that's defined is not through interdependencies. The key issue is the element of segregation. It's a strong term, I know, and I think as Michael Mann uses that term partly because of the situations he's writing about. But it's it, I hope you understand that what that means is that the communities themselves constitute themselves into a we as a kind of cultural entity vis-a-vis -vis some other communities. They could be internally or externally. And that's a kind of conflict. And of course, <coughs> You can see the element of the rights of nationalism is an expression of this to some extent, because the loyalty and the membership are defined upon organic terms below there. But since there are no interdependencies, and the interlocking term in this form of conflict in democracies of we, the people, and how you constitute the we, the demos, right, characterizes a form where what Michael Mann calls where <coughs> cleansing becomes a strategy. <coughs> Cleansing is again the term that he uses, so the book has to be that. But I, it actually articulates quite well if you do it metaphorically rather than how it became literally understood in the context of the, of the breakup of former Yugoslavia, among others. Is that in some way you have to constitute your community as a one and shared cultural entity, where there is in some way no place for others. There could be, but there is actually no place for others. And he says the relation between and then, of course, this relation between these communities doesn't have to be violent. You can say, look, they can coexist. Everyone actually exists in particular or class or whatever. It doesn't have to be violent. And there are all kinds of conditions which actually produce violence. But on the other hand, it's historically and sociologically seen as a particular condition that is particularly prone to certain forms of violence that are there. So there is an embedding in that element. <coughs> and so what well, the argument is, which is where I combine that argument from the time period, yeah. is that this goes, that there is a somehow, and displacing is a difficult term, because you know it's always very easy in present day to say, we had this, and now we have this. Or that exists there, and this exists here. So here, these are areas where we have conflict along the kind of culturalist terms. And in other ones, we have social conflicts. And of course, they coexist in society. But I think what is happening gradually, and there is elements is, if this is happening, and it's, as far as I can see it is, that there is a gradual displacement in politics, where political capital is, and where political debate is, where actually one has a displacement from the social problems and social stratification to a conflict, a culturalization of politics. That's the argument by like, some anthropologists or international relations make as well, uh, like Abadurai. There's a culturalizing of politics happening. We can talk about how that comes if you agree that takes place. It is, of course, not doesn't pop out of nowhere. 
and I also, but you can see that at work as well. When culture becomes a privileged terrain of politics, culture, I mean, I should actually speak much more on this kind of the segregated negation of identities. And you could see that around the refugees. You can also see that how terrorists are actually portrayed and how these things comes together around the expectations of violence and prosper. The refugees, of course, many people treat them as a question of rights. But some of what underlies the the more other discourses that were going on and the political capital that was built and has been built for a long time sees them as, you know, one doesn't always speak it, but it is there culturally, racially, religiously different. Right? Not all people coming in, not even refugee and asylum claims are actually treated on the same grounds. And migration, if you open up the mobility of people generally, this becomes actually even sharper. And we can talk about that. I mean, there are some very interesting kind of correlations between, for example, how comes that free movement within the EU suddenly is such a big thing on the back of Bulgaria and Romania actually joining. There are some very disturbing underlying issues which have to do with the cultural marginal of politics. Uh, that come from there, and it have actually been explicitly expressed on cases. And otherwise, one actually keeps it implicit, but it's interesting to see that politicization of mobilization around migration within Europe moved in the UK, for example. I don't think it's in, it's actually in all countries, but this is specifically UK development. One could see that moving. On the moment of the Bulgaria remain again there, it's actually moved from there, and then it moved on and on. And now it's about free movement in general. Uh, for all, for various different reasons. So I think this is happening. You can see how refugees are treated. I mean, this also came sharply out in other kind of statements that were made in justifying, you know, the closing of borders, that the Syrian refugees were not treated necessarily as right holders only. But you know, the connection with terrorism is partly also they're coming like you know. One always quotes the most radical statements from the Hungarian leader, the Hungarian Prime Minister, and basically saying, you know, we have to protect the Christian Europe. But it's very interesting that more and more of these statements can be made on the bank. You know, there are times people might make them in kind of closed circles, but to express them as justifications for, for example, mobilizing the military on the border. And that somehow one is still taken aback by it, but on the other hand, it doesn't come fully unexpected either that it is there, indicates that there is a shift going on. And I think that kind of shift, if that's correct, that that's part of what's happening, is actually historically quite conducive to actually legitimating forms of violence and transgressive uses of violence by democracies, but also within democracies by other actors. So violence becomes much more an, all, an element of politics, not something that you know one tries to contain on them. It is there and starts informing how politics is organized. So I've covered these two now, and I think I, I do think that the migration terrorism nexus sits also part in that, which is not fully expressed if you actually look at how uh, the institutions of the European Union and policing and criminal justice are. I think there is a cultural element, cultural, religious, identitarian, and racial element process going on, which has been is part of that. And I think this kind of looking at it brings that out. Good. That brings me to. <coughs> the bottom bit here. Don't know whether you can read that. The politics of fear of small numbers governing through anxieties and insecurities. This is that the argument here is, which draws on this book, at least partly on that, I have to do right, the fear of small numbers, is that the culturalizing of politics becomes different and is connected much more to questions of insecurity but also to questions of violence. The moment on the culturalizing goes hand in hand with the politics of the fear of small numbers. And that you can see at play. It's quite often simple in some way. But let me start back why that is a democratic element. Because I'm still arguing that violent democracy is not a mode of politics outside of democracy, but a mode of politics that actually can generate within and through democratic societies. <coughs> Numbers have always been an issue in democracies, right? The very, I mean, for those who have done a bit of democratic theory, one of the big issues in democracy is the tyranny of the majority. Is that in democracies, when you have certain groups who are a majority and you can vote and it's ruled by the majority, 
then of course you can actually always rule in the interest and govern in the interest of the majority against the minority. Hence, there are all kinds of mechanisms institutionalized, if that is the problem, around the dealing with the tyranny of majority. Yeah. <coughs> but the, the issue here is that, of course, this is a fear of numbers, but of majority imposing, which of course goes hand in hand together with the rising of mass democracy, right? where more and more people come in, and the elites are ever less in control. If elections are taken seriously, they, they, they happen to be less in control, or thought they were less in control, than they were before, if you could limit who could vote. Now, the fear of small numbers is, the, is something different, but there's also an obsession with numbers. And it, goes, it hangs together with the culturalizing of politics. If this process is going on that I just described, uh, then the fear of small numbers emerges when the numbers come to signify cultural communities. Cultural communities, identitarian communities. But for me, community is always identitarian, so in that sense, it goes. So the people become divided in a cultural minority and a cultural, cultural minority. And what Abadurai argues is that this actually creates anxieties of incompleteness, in the sense that culturally defined minorities remind the cultural majority about the cultural incompleteness of we, the people. But So there are other people, other cultures there. The nation is never pure, in that sense. right? But it also reminds them, because the others are minorities, about the small gap that exists between being whole and being not one, but still have these two or different <coughs> communities together. So there's an anxiety of incompleteness, and that creates a, it's a particular mode of politics. There is not necessity, a necessity for that to happen. It also insert, it inserts an uncertainty about who belongs. And he says, the fear of small numbers then emerges when one actually starts imagining that the small numbers could become big. And that's, of course, an obvious statement around immigration and the, the way it's politicized, which is if, you know, this ranges from the language of swarms, invasions, being overrun by the other, so we cannot be us anymore, to a statement, we are a Christian Europe, and that, which is also a statement of, I mean, drawing on the long histories and so on. These are quite deeply embedded as well, but you can see they are quite different from if you would actually treat people coming in as workers or as refugees claiming rights, and then negotiate the interdependencies and the stratifications that are possible and not possible with this one. And this fear of small numbers <coughs> and anxiety, it has actually traditionally mobilized violence and expectation of violence to create and assert cultural identity or other forms of segregative <coughs> identities. And you know this can be made in all kinds of for all kinds of reasons, it can be done to protect the community, the right to establish a community, the right to create a nation, and so on. An instrumentalization of violence, because violence also says this out, but we all have dirty hands. You hang at the micro level, one creates groups uh, that are implicated, and so on. But I hope you see that that's part of the fear of small numbers. And in some way, you know, that is at play. And I think this particular instance where terrorism comes together with refugee crisis articulates this and is indicative partly of this happening and plays that terrain as well. Because we should not forget that terrorism, of course, are acts of violence as well and brings violence into the heart of the element. But it also therefore radicalizes and mobilizes quite radical and sometimes violent, quite violent practices at places and conditions. It also means, for example, I don't want to say that all kind of culturalizing of politics this, so cultural identity has no place in terms of articulating. It is one of the reasons why I found a couple of years ago another development so disturbing, which was the discourse about the crisis of multiculturalism, which is a similar articulation. Because if we read multiculturalism, because there are different readings of what multiculturalism is, but if we read that one, as well as a recognition that there is a coexistence and interdependence between cultural identities in a society, then you negotiate. And we know there are issues about discrimination and so on. And you can actually work that as an element of a question of part of the social stratifications and the problems of the social. Which is quite different from the fact that if that all has failed, 
How do we negotiate these things? Do we then, and especially in the current context, if one actually starts moving towards a much more segregative understanding of communities and the relations between them? And I think there are some developments, if you, I mean, it's a macro picture, but if you look at all these bits that happen, there are some quite unsettling things happening. And I do think they actually induce and lead to a toleration of violent practices, but also inscribe violence as an element of, uh, of politics and the prospects. Now, of course, with violence, we can talk about that there. I can't develop that here because I'm coming almost to the end. Uh, of my time is not just the mobilization of terrorist violence or the military violence. I mean, I think the emergence of detention centers and what happens in there are actually forms and the, the image of the camps re-emerging are actually quite violent images and politics that take place. So it's a quite complex picture. But what I wanted, let me see if I can find my pages here. Yes. I'm going to move towards the conclusion now because I'm not going to be able to actually also come to the last point because then I'm going to use another 10 minutes and I think it's better if people have some comments on this. But what I wanted to conclude <coughs> about is that these processes and they're coming together actually are, no, let me formulate this. The connection between the refugees and terrorism that were made actually, I think, play out in that terrain as well, or play out that terrain politically that I've just described. It's not the only one of all, because it's very easy to say there are also other policies and other politics happening in society and discussion. But I think that particular one played out particularly sharply <coughs> in that period in that terrain. And that's why I think it's very unsettling the ease with which these connections were made and how they were framed. <laughs> and how migration and terrorism became, have become, and it's very dangerous for them actually to be connected and become a central site of politics. It's what I say in terms of if we talk politics of insecurity in Europe and the challenges for Europe. I think the violent democracy in this form and this process itself is a security challenge in that sense. We could almost argue. It's an element where actually it is really doing something to democratic forms and how you negotiate conflict which then might lead, or actually can be understood by using the kind of oxymoronic term, violent democracy, in that, together. <coughs> and I think that's profoundly unsettling, and I do think that therefore there is actually, if this is partly correct, and I'm convinced that it's not so spectacular, I think you can read it almost daily now if you, if you read plus, uh, what's happening politically but also administratively and in, in, in other areas. Uh, that, that actually, it is about, it's urgent time that we actually do not politicize so quickly and exclusively to spectacles that have to do with insecurity, terrorism, and migration. But they somehow see and take serious how within these spectacles, when one makes this connection between refugees, very spectacularly, and terrorists, <coughs> Uh, that one actually sees and takes some time to sit down what's this happening in terms of actually constituting a form of democracy which one could call violent democracy, which is an oxymoronic term because democracies are not supposed to be violent, but that's not necessarily what I see is they can create the conditions within violence and they become organized out of violence. And these are particularly, I assume, for many people, disturbing. And so what to do? I have a list of what to do, in very general terms as usual, uh, but one of the things I think what it leads to is actually a political position. Ah, oh, I think I have another slide. Let me just yeah. <coughs> Is the need for reinventing the social as a terrain of politics. And with the social, I do not necessarily mean only the social security state. What I mean with the social is that particular terrain where one translates conflicts in democratic states through questions of interdependencies and social stratification. And in some way what that means is that one actually starts looking, and there it is fascinating to see, once you start looking, there's a lot of practices happening across the board, where many mobilizations are happening, people are moving, whether it's, you know, it's in all countries and it's in Europe as such. Well, one actually claims, I gave a few examples like the sex workers and so on, but there are, there are a myriad once you start looking, the Roma do similar things, about claiming the right to have rights, which is a claim to enter on the negotiation. 
and where you claim certain rights and so on. And so you constitute, reconstitute the struggle as one where the interdependencies are either recognized or where actually one comes very close to actually allowing them in, in a way. And that's a reconstitution, which is not the same as reinventing social democracy in its narrow sense, but it's reinventing or actually paying much more attention to actually making the social a new terrain, or the social a continuing and reinventing and creative terrain for politics. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. So I'm going to introduce the two respondents now, and we will ask each of them to perhaps react immediately to what they've heard for a few moments. Jeff, perhaps to answer them, and then we'll open it to the audience for questions. So Anastasia Tsukala, yes. if you'd like to come up and join us, Anastasia Tsukala is professor of criminology at the University of Paris 11, senior researcher at the University of Paris 5, that's what run, and vice president of the Center for Security Studies in Greece. And I'm going to just, uh, it's hard to sort of read the names of articles and books, I'm going to just name a few themes that she works on so that you can see that uh, her work inserts itself in precisely some of the same areas. Football hooliganism in Europe, security and civil liberties in the balance. Terror, insecurity, and liberty. Illiberal practices of liberal regimes after 9-11. The social construction and control of danger and counterterrorism. Alternatives, global, local, political. False narratives in the migration debate. Yeah, you not, don't want to hear the law? No, it's in the <laughs> One more. <laughs> Um, terrorist threat, freedom, and politics in Europe. And uh, Mike, uh, Martin, would you like to join us up here as well? Martin Rose, um, who has been a British Council officer since 1988. He has served in Baghdad, in Rome, in Brussels, in Ottawa, and Rabat, as well as home postings, which included the setting up of Counterpoint, the Council's think tank on cultural relations. And I believe that was in 2002. And he's currently a visiting fellow at the Prince Valif bin Talal Center for Islamic Studies at Cambridge. And he's written on trust, mutuality, and cultural relations, British public diplomacy in an age of, sch of schisms. He's written on Islam and shared culture, on education reform in North Africa, and how educational reform can contribute to neutralizing violent extremism, and finally, on the changing ecology of language and culture in Morocco. So I think maybe I'll ask uh, Anastasia, would you like to start? Well, yes. Uh, I, uh, I think I have just one question for Jen. Uh, how do you articulate the concept of violent democracy? Uh, um, I will discuss about democracy in, you know, when I, when I will talk about it later. I'm not sure if democracy has such rights. My question is, how do you articulate this with neoliberalism? Because you didn't make, unless I'm mistaken, any mention to the context, I mean, you know, the economic and financial context. All these things are neoliberalism. <coughs> you want me to answer now? No, all right. Yeah. So no time to think, uh, but that's. I think I have time to think. <laughs> yeah, you have time to think. <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, I didn't talk about this, but part of, of course, when you go, there is no accident that the conflict, the first one, is called around social stratification. I mean, part of the, <coughs> of the understanding is that the hollowing out of these conflicts is not because suddenly culture became more popular. It also has to do with what one generally refers to as economic financial politics of neoliberalism, where there has been a hollowing out of social rights and so on that come to it, which actually, I mean, for example, to come back to one of the authors I quoted, Abadurai makes a very big claim that the culturalizing of politics is fundamentally embedded in this neoliberalizing economic of economy and the marketization of all areas and so various areas in society, whereby you know it opened up for a much more radicalizing form of cultural politics, and so there is a connection in that sense. I mean, when you call for reinventing the social, and that's why I call it for reinventing. 
Of course, the terrain in which the socialists played out at the moment is not the same as it was when what this year is referred to as, as mainly the 19th, well, either the late 19th century, early 20th century, or the 1960s, 70s, 80s. Well, 1960s, 70s, and then it's, it's changed. Of course, the terrain today is one in which there has been a profound change in societies, in European societies, on the back of, you know, for lack of a better or worse term, I don't know, neoliberalization of economies. And therefore, for example, you can see that in terms of how some of the security questions are no longer about social security but about precarity. And there's a lot of work being done around precarity as one of these terrains in which one tries to reinvent the social as a terrain of politics. Because precarity is not class related. It's related that you have no certainty in terms of income or whatever where you'll be. And that covers across a whole range of income categories, right? And so some people want to translate it back into class conflict, say precarious classes exist, and they've got other classes, but others say no, it's a different problem. But there is a, therefore a rearticulation needed of the social, and where you can actually make social stratification arguments in new terms. And precarity, of course, functions on the terrain of neoliberal economy. It functions on the terrain of a high marketization, where you are in the market, you can become a consultant, self-responsibilizing for yourself for everything you need to do. Some make a lot of money, some are not, but everyone is uncertain very often about you know, what will happen next year. And so there are, there are issues. I think I use that example to say that that's quite central underlying to why you have this, this understanding that more is going on than just two forms that emerge. No, that is it's partly a displacement going on, which has to do with neoliberalization of society. Right, well, I'm, I'm not a political scientist, um, and I'm going to think in slightly different terms, but I recognize very much what you're talking about, and I, I, can, I can feel it. It seems to me to be a matter of, of as much as anything else, of moral imagination and how we imagine the perimeter of the societies that we live in, where we place it. And a number of images going through my mind as you talk. One was an episode that took place in Canada about six, seven years ago, which some of you may be familiar with, called the Ernonville Ordinance, which was a town ordinance passed by a little village up the Saguenay, uh, which announced that the veil would not be allowed to be worn in Ernonville, uh, and that women walking behind their husbands by three paces would be sanctioned administratively, and so on. The snag there was that there had never been, and to this day never has been, a Muslim, male or female, in Ehrenville, which is several hundred miles up the Saguenay River, and completely out of it. And that seems to me to symbolize the, kind of, the, the, the unmoored imagination that goes on. Um, We've seen maps, overlaid maps, of, of, of the density of migrant or Muslim populations in different parts of Britain, and I'm sure it's true elsewhere too, overlaid with the strength of support for right-wing parties, and they are negatives of each other. They do not touch. They are quite extraordinary in their, in their complete reflection of each other. And I think you know, this, this business of how we imagine the society, the social in which we operate, that you've talked about, Jeff, and how we what is the sphere within which we negotiate and therefore how adequate are the tools that we have for doing it is extraordinarily difficult, is under a lot of pressure at the moment, but is also suffering from lack of leadership in terms of the ethical definition of the universe in which we're operating. And that seems to me to be terrifically important. But it does have to do with migration, and not, not in the direct sense. Not in the sense that there are lots of people beating at the doors and God help us all, what are we going to do? But because we have people coming very often from societies in which collective representation and collective sub-identities are a given. And if you watch the progress of a general election in Iraq, for example, you will see people voting not because of what they think but because of who they are. They're queuing up and they're getting their fingerprints purple and they're doing all the right stuff. But those people have a different concept of negotiation within a differently imagined ethical community than we do. And it's the putting of those together that is so vastly problematic, I think. So that I think that migration, while it isn't a direct cause <coughs> in the sense that, of, of you know, a threat, and I think that everything that you're saying about the militarization of borders, about the, the, the way in which violence has become a currency of negotiation, 
seems right. But I think that some of the triggers are being imported in ways um, that we are allowing to happen, it seems to me. Um, and you can see the same thing happening in the Middle East. You can see the negotiations of Middle Eastern governments with the United States over military aid predicated on the exaggeration of military threats, whether they're terrorist threats, military threats, whatever they are. It's all about a security bidding war. And so I think you know, that there are all sorts of pressures which if we don't recognize and if we don't analyze in such a way as to be able to cope with them and to neutralize them, precisely what you're describing seems to be likely to happen. Uh, and I'm sorry to run ramble, but uh, the other thing that struck me as I was listening to you talking about attitudes to migration was that wonderful remark, supposedly, of the Duke of Wellington's about the railways. You can't have railways, they allow the working class to move around. <laughs> I just want to make two quick points. One is about the voting for who you are, I don't think that's necessarily defined because it's you know it's an element about where you actually harm and how people are and therefore they have an identity, therefore they actually will be inscribed dispositions, which mean they act in particular ways. Now I come from a country originally where people voted for who they were, right? In Belgium you vote in pillars of the elements. But these builders were cut across by serious <coughs> social stratification debates as well, and inside too. So you had actually kind of, it's not necessarily so that because you vote who for you are, that's the case. So there's something about how institutions, societies are set up, and in that sense, I do know whether that's correct or not, that people bring in certain predispositions. I also do think as being a, a kind of closet sociologist, you know, you don't stay the same. The society's dispositions actually are quite different. And therefore, the culturalizing of politics in societies is actually quite a problematic element because it reinscribes certain practices of doing politics in everyone and identifying and so on. So that's one element. The second element I have is about the concept of moral imagination. There is an element about imagination going on, but I think it's always very important not to just see it as a moral ethical imagination, but also to look at that maps or instruments of policy. Right? Once you start mapping elements and doing statistics in a particular way, they become inscribed into the policy. And for example, I can give you an example how I can do again the country where I come from originally, you know, the whole idea about having two language communities and they're becoming politically ever more sensitive between French speaking and Flemish speaking is not an element only about party political mobilization. It's also an element where social statistics, you know, I mean social welfare rights statistics, economic statistics, all statistics become organized around one community and another community. So you actually have an inscription of the existence of these communities within policy. So this is not just imagination, it actually becomes a really, all these elements like maps, statistics, and so on, it's become instruments through which policy becomes articulated, and it's a, often a much more effective way to actually institutionalize in big organizations like states or the EU certain things, which is why it's very important, I think, to look at, for example, I should not detach these kind of statements that I had from developments that where I started off referring to the institutionalization of certain policies and certain conceptions of the border within the EU, as is how borders are conceptualized, how are they done, how are things actually statistically represented, how are rights formulated, and, 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 and discussions about rights stone. So that's what I would like to add. I mean, this does not mean there's no moral ethical imagination going on, but I think it's very important for how these actually are embedded and become embedded within. So there is more going on than just imagination and discourse and framing in, in, in a discursive sense, in that way. I did speak that for a moment, and the way in which the, the imagination is then given flesh. Uh, is actually terribly important because if it's happening at a time when the when the imagination is changing, you actually get some very bad things put into numbers and put into definitions, and therefore it's quite important. Yeah, I mean. No, I think maybe we'll turn it to the audience at this point. So I'll walk through and hand you this um, portable mic. Who would like to start? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Is this one? Oh, that's even louder. Okay, at least I can hear myself better now. <laughs> Thanks, Elspeth. This is a very interesting question. Partly it is because I fall in the trap of particularly what security analysts do always. It's the doom and gloom of things that are there. And one forgets about that these things don't come about in you know a kind of mechanical way, driven the, the threats and the issues are there, and therefore you always do the worst case analysis as if it and do it in one way. I agree that <coughs> I wanted to bring it out in this way, but I don't think it's the po it's the it is the picture of the politics of insecurity. If politics is about the contestation and contentions that actually are important in shaping the limits and whether it's the imagination, the institutionalization of these issues, and in some way the dooming, the kind of you know, the dark side of democracy that Michael Mann is actually a very strong overstatement. That's why I ended with saying that, of course, the way to do it is actually to look at, for example, how people are contesting all the time. They don't have to be the institutional big legal contestations or the big political discourses. They can also be actually bringing out, we've experimented at some point with a project around acts of citizenship in Europe, which was not about the very big counter discourses around for example, people mobilizing explicitly en masse for refugees, for example, on human rights discourse, not on charity, right? Uh, <coughs> in that element. But also look at if you start moving, for example, how the issues around the Roma are contested in various, from various dispositions. They come up as very fragmented, but if you actually map them across Europe, there is a lot of that contestation happening. So it's a political terrain. It's not a kind of sociological terrain in the sense of a particular development that is inevitably taking place in this. There's a lot of struggle going on. And in a way, yes. But I think to bring out the contestation within this, then I would probably have spoken for another 30. Because I need to do the flip side then, right? There's a way of doing it, to do the politics in a particular way. But I would agree. I mean, it's not a given, although I am still find it quite unsettling. I still think part of the, what's going on in the connections that are so easily made is this. But it doesn't come easy, that's true. But then on the other hand, I also think in the report you contributed to what's very interesting is the connection, right? We have the denial and the political fights, but the question is also how is that actually being institutionalized? For example, in, is it is one succeeding in changing elements in the way Eurojust works, the criminal policies towards terrorism are working, how migration becomes treated ever in the EU out of the kind of security arena in Schengen and so on. So there are processes happening there as well which are actually I think also important. That's also part of where the contestation is taking place. And so it's, it's a complicated picture in that sense. And my only excuse is, you know, if I do that one I have to actually start. Then you need to look at particular, no more narrow thing to get some of the details out that are taking place, I think. But I agree. I mean, there is politics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just add something uh, regarding this relationship, uh, let's say the migration or refugee crisis security issue? My problem is that dates don't match, if I may say so. I mean, terror attacks in Paris <coughs> occurred in November, right? The refugee crisis was obvious by the beginning of summer. Mm -hmm. And very rapidly we realized, I mean, we, I mean, I'm Greek, if in case you haven't noticed by my name, uh, we realized that there was a huge problem on the other side of the border. Because, very, to put it in very simple terms, it is not a question of discourse, but rather what is unspoken. And what was unspoken is that we do not want them here, period. 
We don't know how to do it and how to say it, but the fact is that we don't want them here. And if I may say so, evidence was that when Hungary was the first country to behave in a not so democratic way, there was no outcry, unless I'm mistaken. Nobody really said, what on earth is going on here? This is over the violation of, of EU law, of international law. You don't have the right, these people are refugees, you don't have the right. What happened was that the more democratic European leaders were somehow hidden behind this bad fascist Hungarian leader, who was in fact very convenient. And then we saw borders uh, appearing and then disappearing and then appearing again. Do they exist? Don't they exist? Uh, the border between Greece and Macedonia is the most uh, surrealistic border I have ever imagined. Uh, it may open for some hours within a day, then close, then open again, then close. Does it exist? For whom? So when the terror attacks happened in November, they simply legitimized what was already at work. We at least had a good excuse to say, you see, after all, now, you know, these are bad people there, potentially, and we're afraid of them. Yet, there was a very single element, and this is the criminologist talking. The very day I, I saw the report that there was this passport there, I just simply, you know, in a very naive way, asked myself, how is this possible? This guy totally, you know, exploded in hundreds of pieces. And this passport was somehow in a magical way put safely aside so that we can find it and make the link. Gee, what a coincidence. And what about their ID cards? They were French and Belgian citizens, unless I'm mistaken. Why would you find these ID cards safely put aside as well to know who they were? It was a very idiot question I raised myself the very day I found out that. I, I'm not sure I was the only one who raised the question. Sure you yeah. <laughs> do you want to take a few more questions or do you? A few more questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you can, you can take them. I, I mean, my, you know, I'm not going to comment on I had similar ideas about how these passports were actually suddenly emerging. But that does not, I mean, the point I didn't want to make is I'll see when I actually, if I ever write it up, how to do it. I didn't want to make the point that the terrorism element drives the refugee policy, and the security element is not connected to the terrorism. I used as a hook about, you know, yeah. what's going on that's there, because uh, the timelines are clear around uh, security and migration and refugees and how they have been done, and the refugee crisis longer and so on. Whether the terrorism just came in as justification, that's, of course, an element. Of course, there might be elements of it, but what I try to say is it's not an element just of political justification. It's also not surprising. It can be. It's not like it's surprising the context is made. It's not unexpected. So there's an institutionalization that makes these connections possible to emerge at some point in time. I agree with that. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that was the point I tried to make. Yeah, I agree with you. So I know a lot about institutionalization, but coming more from the practices and behaviors and how those become influenced over time and then become embedded in the practices in such a way that they become you know, very much something we don't recognize anymore as being just the, the, the normal, the background. And I think one of the things that we, those of us who are laymen in terms of the political theory, criminal theory, etc., are struggling with is the, the side of the politics that's the unspoken. You started to, I think, allude to that. It's the things that are going on that um, can't be overtly discussed in the democratic sphere that we live in today uh, because they are, they are not allowed topics, and yet they go on in the background, and so over time they start to influence behaviors. So let me give an example. The, the fact that we're not sure yet people who have struggled in Europe and in, in the modern societies over time to become 
you know, peers who have, are now colleagues, struggle with how we become friends with the woman who's the two steps behind, for example, her husband. And so in all politics being local, in the small community where the woman is walking two steps behind, and I'm walking along with my husband, I don't know how to befriend a woman in the two steps behind position, nor do I know how to relate to that. So on the local level of politics, my hope will probably go towards someone who is going to help me to continue to have my kind of way of life and culture as compared to one that might be trying to adapt and negotiate a middle ground that would probably bring us a couple of steps back. Me one step back behind my husband and her maybe two behind hers. Um, so that's a, that's a very blunt reality, and just a small micro example, because over time, those things do happen that change, uh, they are political, and then they change what our sort of, what we take for granted as everyday life, whether it's the hours at the pool that, you know, we can't swim in some hand and, you know, or I happen to be on the board of a hospital, I know there are some people who come and they, they cannot be seen by certain doctors because of certain things. They do change our practice and our way of life. And I believe there's something in these discussions, whether they ultimately get controlled by the issue of security, it's about our personal security and our comfort with our society that we've constructed together as European citizens over a very long time. And this is where this small number is becoming large becomes a real issue for us in the political sphere. Whether that's locally and how we vote to try to control that around our own community, or whether it's national, international, and European level, where we say to ourselves, what kind of future do we want, and how are we going to negotiate in families? I'm not sure it was a question, but I can see the comment uh, in the... Let me try to... I mean, I would not disagree with what you say, but I think partly what's, whether it's the spoken or the unspoken, I mean, the, the element of democracy, looking at it in terms of social conflict, is not just about public speech. That's, I hope, I've tried to say also in reply to the question of contestation. <coughs> because there's an element that is all about the big discourses in the public sphere, uh, which is part of what's going on. But of course, democracy is also about, I mean, the women's causes. If you say, I vote for things in my own interest, but that's reducing democracy to voting. Social stratification conflicts are conflict not about just the voters. They're about social organization and mobilization and the relations between them. They're about institutionalizing processes that are taking place and the contestations that happen there. And so these are not disconnected, but it's not from the micro all the way straight into institutionalization. There are elements that are in there. And one of the, the other questions, so that I would normally look at these wider processes that are going on, although there is very interesting stuff happening on the micro level too. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to raise, which I didn't get to, is uh, that connections have been made on the security element, which is where I started from saying not to know what to talk about around insecurity. When you say that the personal securities and insecurities. Now, there are elements about that this is not this this has been created in such a way because of the circulation of all kinds of insecurities around which migration refugees are one element that are there which influence dispositions that one creates kind of forms of personal dispositions which are actually informed by quite neurotic anxieties one would say so as a form as a figure of the person and that, of course, feeds partly in to then, some people would argue, where you actually hook back in particular policies. So the, there are differences as well at what personal security and insecurity means, and if you try to translate that into a political category, it does not necessarily have to hook up in processes that I described in that way. There are certain forms in which personal insecurities become connected to the wider processes. And, you know, I couldn't develop that, that's part of my other work, it's really, I mean, this idea about what does it mean for societies, but also for citizenship and so on, that we have this incredible seeming circulation of safety, insecurity, across a wide range of areas, 
around which we seem to organise. But in this lecture, I wanted to draw attention to something, an element that's often forgotten, which has to do with that certain processes inscribe the expectation and prospects of violence as an element in politics. And I think that's important to look at, too, because violence is the big silence in democracy very often. Yes. No, uh, I was too soft at the beginning. You should be, you know, aware that I wouldn't stop. Yeah, I was surprised. No, uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I, I keep on thinking about this term of yours, uh, violent democracy. Um, I, I, it's all right with me, you know, with the term of violence. Democracy doesn't fit. And I kept on wondering why. And then I came back, you now, uh, as far as I can recall, in the way you define democracy. It was a sound definition, the way the system is functioning, the way it manages people. But unless I'm mistaken, you didn't mention the value system this regime is supposed to rest upon. And here is where my problem arises. I mean, if I take three examples, the current refugee crisis, the, the way uh, the France uh, has managed or intends to manage the um, let's say, terrorism crisis, and the, uh, the Greek debt crisis. These three cases have one common point. They mark the negation of the value system we used to take for granted in liberal democracies, in different ways, in different respects, but the total negation of what we used to take for granted, though I was not the only one we knew it was artificial, it was a bit of construction, social construction, political construction, whatever, it was there, and we would take it for granted. What we have is that, at least, an illusion, I admit it, but we grow up, you know, believing that within this European space we have to fight to improve our rights, and then as we are generous people, we should also look around for other you know, poor guys, so that they become sooner or later like us. And what we see here is that we have a European country that has lost national sovereignty in the total indifference, that has a population that lost all social rights, political rights, human rights, liberties, whatever, in the total indifference. Why not, after all? I don't, it's all right. I mean, cynically speaking. No, it's all right, cynically speaking. It's far away. You know, the empathy needs proximity. Hmm? To put it, you know. <laughs> and then we have a refugee crisis, total negation of what mankind is, of solidarity. And then we have, you know, the French crisis, total negation of what this French Revolution was supposed to bring to mankind. So in fact, what is a democracy without the values it used to go with? Uh, I'm not making life easy to me, I know, but... Well, it's not too difficult either. I mean, because that's not the point I wanted to make. I know, right? I know. Uh, because that's another point I've made. Uh, that's a yeah. point I make elsewhere. Yeah. But I think that brings back to the. I mean, if we talk about values and so on, they become they are institutionalized and are there. But there is also a question about the negating of the values, which is one of the major concerns. Which is why there's so many contestations happening, and why it becomes easy and not so easy all the time. In it, I mean. You can speak for Greece, right? I don't want to do that in that way. But I mean, even there, one has struggled and tried, one lost. But it's meaningless yeah. contestation in Greece. This in Greece, but I mean, in, 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 so in the European sphere. But let me come back to the violent element. The reason why I did violent democracy is that, of course, what one usually does, if one is interested, if the point of the talk is actually to say that there is a concern about, you know, that violence becomes and I didn't define violence, I said it's actually quite broad, that violence becomes a, the user's prospect is on the combined, become inscribed within the political system as matters around which you organize and through which you organize politics, then that I think is, is a different matter. That's what I wanted to draw attention to. Usually, when that happens, one says one is outside of democracy. But of course, this is not so simple when you look at these things that the processes are embedded within democratic elements. It does not mean, I had another quote I didn't get there to, to Franz Neumann and so on, that, you know, 
who studied McCarthyism and the rise of fascism and so on. Uh, well, of course, when, when this takes place, one is walking quite a tight line where one actually transgresses into all the limits that have been set to what is finally possible. It has to do also with the value system that's in place. And so it's a very tight line when this actually starts working in the way I try to describe it, where one reaches the limit of what is democratically, what is still democratically, poli oh, sorry, what is still democratic politics in that way. But I do think it's important not to do the usual liberal move where violence is outside of democracy. No. Because then actually one actually doesn't <coughs> never get what is actually happening. That there is, it, I think it's part of the process. That the violence is that under, and it's important to draw attention to that. That actually they become part of a political scene. That's the argument I'm trying to make <coughs> here. But it's a tight line. But then liberalism doesn't give us the answer there, because then violence is very often, you know, the exceptional that was out, where we reached our limits already. And that doesn't allow the analysis of how it actually starts embedding itself within democratic institutions, which are, you know, to some extent still have characteristics of what we recognize yes. as democracies. Yes, and that's why you can so. find another term. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyone on the panel? <coughs> Anyone in the audience who might want to talk about this conflation of terrorists and refugees, perhaps aided by the media, for example, who might want to move outside the theoretical structure that Jenna shared with us? If not, yes, good. Every time I think we're finished, we're finished. <laughs> so I should <laughs> finish. Oh, please. Uh, all right, well, I'm a retired age teacher from the Eastern Tasana, from the United States. I was, I'm also going to see if you have time for, but I'm very interested in what you have to say about government is anxiety, because I have a little theory that perhaps the referendum may um, march into very quickly um, this year is on the back of fears about terrorists, immigration, um, with the hope of leaving. That's a big question for a new lecture. Thank, no, I think it's a good question. I mean, but it's, uh, I don't think I can deal with it in, in two minutes. It has to do with partly, you know, the bottom line why it fits in for me here is that the uh, Governing to anxieties, fears, risks, insecurities somehow creates communities of insecurity which actually become ever, ever more anxieties. They become somehow self enclosed and self oriented and internal looking, and the segregative kind of elements are reinforced in that way. And so that's how I would use the question of governing to anxiety in this particular context and how it fits in here. Because you, you create, you know, we come together as communities facing. And it's very interesting because, of course, you can say that the traditional elements, communities come together on to define fear of a particular kind of process or enemy or whatever. But there is something going on which is different within the circulation of the various anxieties and safeties across the board, from global warming all the way to, you know, the precarity of your personal situation, and it's done all the way through, that actually moves us from a defined fear towards something, also feeds into an element where it's actually kind of anxiety. It's the old distinction between fear and angst, right? This element where you have an undefined anxiety, and that seems to be a process that, you know, sometimes one says constitutes communities in a particular way. In my it's very interesting to see how teenagers young readers are, are absolutely attached to dystopic novels. That's what they like to read from. It's a new film for um, other styles of reading, but that's mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating about that. Yeah, it's a difficult process to pin down because there's a circulated anxiety becomes a highly cultural institution, but also a very micro process in some way that's taking place. And so it's difficult to get a grip on, but it is something is happening, I think, there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I have the very pleasant duty now of, first of all, thanking Jeff, thanking Martin, thanking Anastasia, and thanking Celeste, and all of you. 
um, for being a fantastic audience. So shall we just uh, thank the panel and the chair in the normal way?